Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to start thinking about this 3D beam uh, stiffness matrix, the full 3D beam element. So we start off here, this was our 2D element. Now we spent the last lecture talking about the stiffness matrix for this 2D element. Uh, we've got node I, node J, we've got three degrees of freedom at each node, six degrees of freedom in total. Okay, and that is the stiffness matrix, well, the, the force displacement relationship that we talked about in the previous lecture. All right, so where to next? We've got to start thinking about this guy, this 3D beam element, right? That's what this course is all about. So again, we have node I and a node J here, and we have an X, Y, Z axis system at each node. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is start thinking about what's our convention here for setting up this axis system. Now, we're going to use what's called the right-hand rule. So the right-hand rule, you might have come across it before, but it's just a convention um, that allows you to build an axis system in a predictable way. So what you do is basically you take your right hand, take your thumb, and point your thumb along the direction of the x-axis. Okay, For us, the x-axis is always going to be the longitudinal axis, as it's shown here on this beam. So your thumb points along the x-axis direction. Your index finger, your next finger, index finger, points in the direction of the y-axis, and then your middle finger points in the direction of the z-axis. Okay, so your right hand, the first three, or the thumb and two fingers of your right hand are a model, essentially, for the axis system that we're going to apply to each node within our structures. Okay, so think about, the way to remember it is, is that uh, you've got uh, x, y, and z, uh, and you, you would count one, two, and three, and you would also then, well, I would associate that with x, y, and z. So your thumb is always x, your index finger is always Y and then your middle finger is always Z and you can see that's that model predicts or yeah it predicts the the axes on each node of this 3D member. So that's the axis system we're going to use. Uh, it's the right hand axis system and the other point to make here is that the the local longitudinal axis, yeah, the longitudinal axis is always going to be our x-axis, okay? So that's gonna always allow us to set up, uh, relative to our member, an axis system, a local axis system, okay? So, let's think about degrees of freedom next. We have an axis system, now we've got degrees of freedom. So, these are the six degrees of freedom from the 2D world. These are the degrees of freedom that we've already been looking at, right? So we've got longitudinal degrees of freedom, okay? And of course, I've drawn a, a longitudinal force on here. So we've got Fxi and Fxj. We've got the transverse force or the shearing force, which is Fyi and Fyj. And then we have a moment about the x-axis, Mzi and Mzj. So we haven't labored the point previously about these moments being about a z-axis, but it becomes very obvious and very apparent when you look at a 3D element uh, that that moment is, of course, about a z-axis. So there are the degrees of freedom we know about. Okay, Now we've got to think about what are the extra degrees of freedom that we need to layer on top of this guy uh, in order to fully describe 3D behavior. So the first one is going to be our transverse forces. right? So there's an, an additional two degrees of freedom, which is going to be a force in the z direction at node i and node j. On top of that, we're going to add a torsional moment. Okay, so we've got an mxi here and an mxj down here. And then on top of that, we've got a transverse moment or a moment about the y-axis, so myi and myj. So every single axis here has um, a force and a moment, a force along it and a moment about it. And so that is an additional six degrees of freedom on top of the six we already had. So that gives us a total of 12 degrees of freedom. So that fully defines the behavior of our member. So we've got axial force, we've got uh, vertical shearing force, not always vertical, let's just call it direct shearing force. We've got a transverse shearing force. We have a torsional moment, we have a major axis bending moment and a minor axis bending moment. And then the last point is just to say that the x-axis is always going to be our longitudinal axis and therefore the mx moment is always going to be a torsional moment. Okay, so that is our full 3D element. So next we have to think about the stiffness matrix. Okay, so that's that's what the uh, that's what we've got to focus on now. So we, we already know the idea, the concept that a set of forces or moments is related to the corresponding uh, displacements and rotations through the stiffness matrix. So what you're looking at now is the stiffness matrix, right? It's a whole load of 
question marks in there because we have to work out what are the stiffness coefficients that go in there. Uh, but what you have, what you can see here, are all of the stiffness coefficients from our two D uh, element. Okay, put straight in. Okay, so I'm saying I've got twelve actions and twelve responses. So you can see I've plugged in the axial stiffness coefficients. These are the ones we already know about. Okay, that we've seen previously. We've got the transverse shear coefficients. Again, we've seen these. Uh, we started off this lecture with uh, with this with this matrix, uh, with these transverse shear stiffness coefficients. We have what we're going to call the major axis uh, bending stiffness coefficients. Again, from the two D world. Uh, and that basically is all of our 2D components plugged into a fuller, larger 3D stiffness matrix. Okay. Okay, so the next thing to say then is there's a whole lot of zeros in here now that I've highlighted. Now, what that's saying is there is no cross axis coupling between actions. So we're assuming, for example, that there is, uh, let's say we have axial shortening of our members. We're assuming that that has no impact within our larger structure, that has no impact on the bending within our members. Similarly, we're assuming that bending about one axis has no interaction or no effect on bending about a perpendicular axis. So up until this point, looking at 2D frame structures, um, we've been looking at bending moments and we, we can assume that they were applied about a major axis, okay, the strong axis of bending for a particular member. Well, now with a 3D element, we're having to take into account bending about a perpendicular minor axis uh, and what we're saying here is there's no coupling between bending in the major axis and bending in the minor axis and similarly there's no coupling between axial forces and bending so that's really what all those zeros throughout that stiffness matrix are saying Okay, so the next, we, we got to now think about how do we fill in what's left, okay? So we've we put a whole lot of zeros in there, but that still leaves a lot of question marks around stiffness coefficients. So we've got to think about filling in the transverse and minor axis bending coefficients, so transverse shear and minor axis bending stiffness coefficients. So I've highlighted those in green. And then we've got a layer on top of that, the torsional stiffness coefficients. So really, that's what we've got to do now. What we're going to start talking about in the next lecture is how do I derive the stiffness coefficients, first of all, for uh, the transverse force and the moment with the y axis. And then in the lecture after that, we'll put on the torsional stiffness coefficients. Now, the to give a little bit of um, a bit of a heads up about what to expect, it's actually relatively straightforward to work out these stiffness coefficients because once you've done it for major axis bending uh, and an axial force as well, you've got most of the work done. It's the exact same process to work out the stiffness coefficients for minor axis bending uh, and transverse shear and torsion. Okay, so that's enough said. That is the stiffness matrix. Or that's the setup of the stiffness matrix. In the next lecture, as I say, we'll go ahead and start working out what are those missing uh, stiffness coefficients.